Welcome to Disseminate the Computer Science Research Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Wardby. Today, I'm joined by Suvadeep Sakar, who will be telling us everything we need to know about log-structured merge trees. Suvadeep is a, or he's going to be, I say, in, uh, in July, an assistant professor of computer science at Brandeis University. So, Suvadeep, welcome to the show and congratulations on your new appointment. Uh, so thank you and uh, thank you. Uh, I love to be here. It's uh, uh, great for you to invite me. And uh, I'm very excited to start my new life at Brandeis. And this is essentially uh, the first podcast that I'm doing as an assistant professor. So I'm super excited. <laughs> brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. Cool. So obviously I've given you a very brief introduction there, but maybe you can tell the listener a little bit more about yourself and how you became interested in databases, data management and all the cool things that we all love. Of course. So I did my PhD on something that is completely different. It was more like I did theoretical research in computer science and cloud computing. Uh, but as I was doing so, I realized that I wanted to do more system stuff, both research-wise and development-wise. Uh, so after my PhD, I moved to INRIA in France. And it is there that I was exposed, exposed to large-scale systems. And the multitude of data management challenges that you face when you operate on data systems and operate on large scales of data. So instantaneously, I was hooked. Uh, so specifically, my journey started uh, with the problem on how we can uh, delete data efficiently from large scale data stores. So if I remember correctly, GDPR was about to be enforced at that time, and it was um, really in the interests of interest of many companies that they want to delete user data in a scalable manner. And uh, it was fascinating for me that how a seemingly simple task of data deletion can become so tricky when we operate at scale. So uh, this is what made me really interested into data management research. And then after my time at Indria, I moved to uh, Boston University spent about four and a half years working on uh, the same problem and some more other problems as well. And now I am truly in love with this new domain. Amazing. What a, great, a great origin story and, and how you became hooked on this, this really cool research area. Um, so, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about log structured merge trees. So maybe for the uninitiated, you can kind of start off by explaining what the hell this, this really cool data structure is. Well, uh, truth be told, I did not even know hear about LSM trees five years back. So, uh, but the truth of the story is, today uh, LSM trees are sitting at the heart of many data systems, relational and non-relational alike. So, uh, if I have to take a few names, you, we have all heard about of RocksDB at Meta, uh, Bigtable, LevelDB at Google, Xengine at Alibaba, Cassandra, HBase at Apache. So all these big databases, which are primarily used as key value data stores, have LSM trees as the underlying data structure. So what is an LSM tree? Essentially, it is yet another data structure. It is a highly write optimized data structure. It is a data structure that was built uh, to support data when the data does not fit in memory and data is storage resident. So uh, the exponential data growth that we have seen over the past couple of decades where data really do not fit in memory anymore, uh, we have seen more and more systems adopt the LSM paradigm. So several systems have either moved away from B plus trees to have LSM based indexes, or they have extended support to LSMs while retaining their B plus tree implementation. So LSM trees uh, in, in a single sentence, it is a, right optimized storage based data structure that can also help us index data. Amazing. So you touched on it a little bit there about the history of LSM trees, but maybe you can dive into this a little bit more. When, when was this data structure first proposed? And you mentioned a few of the uh, few of the systems there that are using it. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about their, like why they chose to use those, that, that data structure as well. Awesome. Um, this is a interesting question. So LSM trees were first proposed um, by Pat O'Neill and his colleagues from here in Boston, out of Boston, in 1996. And for the next 10 years, there, was, there were literally only a couple of papers that talked about these data structures. No one knew about this data structure. No one really cared about them. There was not a single database that used LSMs underneath. So in 2006, when we had the big data booms just starting up, 
uh, Google wanted to build a data structure and build a new data system uh, that would be based on the key value paradigm. And they wanted to use commodity hardware uh, to build these large scale data systems. So they kind of moved away from the area of disk uh, paradigm that we have seen in the 80s. And when they wanted to move away to commodity hardware, telephone trees were really a data structure that gained their attention. So it was, as I mentioned, storage based. So essentially, it does not really uh, care whether the data fits in memory or not. Rather, it is super suitable when the data is large in size. And second, it is highly write optimized. So in an era of data boom, where you have a lot of data and you want to ingest the data to your data store really fast, telephone trees were really the data structure of choice. And in the following year, starting up from 2007, several companies understood the utility of uh, LSM trees as the storage layer data structure. And as I mentioned, a bunch of NoSQL data stores adopted LSM trees to be their data structure of interest. Uh, not only that, there are several relational databases like MyRox at Meta, um, SQLite, which have LSM trees running underneath. There are a few time series databases such as InfluxDB, QuasarDB, which are also based on LSM trees. So uh, this is how the uh, how LSM trees become from uh, not a data structure of interest to a data structure of super interest in less than three decades. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's. It, I mean, it's such a rarity that uh, something like because 19, the, the mid 90s is, is really recent, right? In sort of database history, right? I mean, there's always that. So we always have this joke uh, with, with a lot of my guests that everything was already done in system art and then the, kind of all the cool ideas are taken. So it's really interesting to see that kind of something that's kind of quite late on the scene and it's kind of quite revolutionary as well. And that it's been used by so many data systems today. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Let's 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 dive into these into a little bit more depth then. So. You've, I know you, you've done several tutorials on LS, LSM trees um, over the last couple of years at, at Sigmod and I, ICDE. So, and you always kind of start off by talking about the key operating principles of LSM-based storage engines. So could you maybe tell us what these key operating principles are? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great question. And uh, another way to think about this question is that um, how are LSM trees fundamentally different from classical index structures? say B plus trees. So essentially if we can compare and contrast these two data structures side by side, we might be able to understand the uh, key operating principles as you mentioned of LSM trees. So the first thing that comes to my mind is LSM trees is an ingestion friendly data structure and it has an in-memory component that we often refer to as the LSM buffer. So as incoming data Comes, so we do not really move them to the storage aggressively. So if you think about a B plus tree, uh, if you have an insert uh, uh, operation, you will have to traverse through the root, move to the leaf node, access all the intermediate pages in between, and then write your data to the leaf node. In LSM trees, we try to amortize the cost of ingestion. So instead of paying a logarithmic cost, we buffer a bunch of inserts in memory, so no storage access whatsoever. And then when the in-memory buffer is full, we lazily flush it to the storage. So this is how we really achieve a superior ingestion performance in LSM tree. The second thing that comes into mind is the out-of-place update and delete paradigm that LSMs follow. So again, going back to B plus trees, if you want to update a data or delete a data, it is in place. And what do I mean by in place? You will literally have to start from the root, go to the last leaf, where the data is contained, then you have to rewrite the data or delete the data and do the, all the necessary actions required. Uh, so you pay a, a very high cost here as well because you are doing a lookup to find the key and then modifying the key in place. So LSM trees do not follow this paradigm at all. So if you have to update a data, uh, you simply insert the new version of the data. So you do not even look for or touch the existing entry. The only thing that you have to make sure that whenever you have a query, the query accesses the recent version first before it accesses the older version. And once you re access the recent version, your query terminates. So there is no way you will be returning an invalid entry. Deletes happen the same way. 
So you do not go in place and uh, uh, delete an entry, rather you insert something that we call a tombstone, which logically invalidates the entry. So essentially, uh, these are the two fundamental ways how LSM trees are different from uh, B plus trees. And one other thing that comes to my mind, if you think of a B plus tree as you, it supports in place updates, uh, the leaf nodes are almost always not completely full. So on a, in a stable situation, they are probably 67% full. LSM trees on the other hand, operate on the notion of immutable files. So what does that mean? It means that once you move something from the memory to the storage, you can never go and make in-place edits in the file. This allows LSMs to achieve a superior space efficiency. It's just so it, it really can use the device space, the storage space in a very efficient way. So uh, fundamentally, these are the three axes that comes to my mind how LSMs are different from uh, B plus trees. There are of course several similarities. So both of them facilitate index structures. In a B plus trees, uh, the data is probably in the last level and all the intermediate levels are used for indexing. Uh, LSM trees in that sense is probably uh, more closer to uh, B trees or B epsilon trees because that there is indexing structure that we have, but the data and the key are always together, even in the intermediate uh, levels of the tree. Uh, another similarity is that, as you know, what, what we call a B plus tree fan out essentially becomes the size ratio in an LSM tree. So every level has an exponentially larger capacity. This way we can really limit the number of levels that we end up having in an LSM tree. And finally, like we have node splits and merges in B plus tree, which I refer to as data reorganization, we have something called compactions in LSM trees. So uh, every time a level goes, level size goes beyond the threshold, we move some part of the data from that level and merge it or compact it with the overlapping part of the next level. So uh, again, essentially it is, uh, once again, it's still an index structure, but it has certain similarities and certain uh, differences when it comes to classical indexes. I, I love the positioning against the B tree because it kind of, having that as sort of a, um, a yardstick to measure against and see how it differs is really, really nice. It's a really nice way to kind of compare these two data structures. So that's great. So let's talk about this some more then. So you, you, break, you break down the operations we can then do on log structured merge trees and, and into internal operations like flushing and compaction and some of the external operations like um, updating and reading and, and, and stuff like this. So can you maybe... First of all, work us through how the, how, the, how the internal operations like flushing and compaction actually work in practice. Of course, of course. Yeah, so internal operations are operations that are really not triggered from the user side. I mean, they are probably triggered, but not explicitly, right? So internal operations is that when a LSM buffer gets full, we need to move all the data from the buffer, which is in memory, to the storage. Right, so this is the operation that we often refer to as flush in LSM terminology, right? So a flush is nothing but after the buffer is full, we sort all the entries in the buffer based on the key. So we have a sorted component and then we write all of them to the slower storage as an immutable run. So flush is essentially moving data uh, from the memory to the storage in form of immutable sorted run. And the second thing that you mentioned is compaction. I briefly touched upon this before. So compaction is like any index data structure, as you have more and more data, you have to reorganize your index structure. Or in B plus trees, we do, do this by splitting the nodes or merging the nodes based on the workload that we have. In LSM trees, we do the same. We just call them compaction. So a compaction is every level, as you can imagine, has a capacity which is exponentially growing as we are moving down in the tree. But once the size of a level goes beyond the capacity, we can do two things. One, we can either move all the data from that level and sort merge it with the data from the next level. This sort merge operation is essentially the compaction. Or two, what we can do is that we can just move some part of the data from the level that is full and merge it with the overlapping part in terms of the key ranges from the next level. So these are classically the two ways how we implement compactions. But as you can imagine, 
both flush and compactions are something that LSM engines have to do in order to make sure that, that they retain the tree structure. So this is why we call them internal operations. I see, I see, I see, cool. So let's let's then flip the flip this kind of coin and look at the other side from like kind of the user level and the external operations, the, the gets and the puts and the scans. So how do these things work over and how do they then trigger these internal operations? Absolutely. So as you can, as the name suggests, external operations are really what we see in the workload, right? So LSM trees, as I mentioned before, is a key value engine, storage engine, right? So every entry that you can see, it has a key based on which we organize the entries in the tree and all the other attributes, whatever you have, they are clubbed together and they constitute the value field. So we have this key value entries that come into an elephant tree and we support the different operations uh, through what we call a put get API. So what is a put? Put is nothing but an insert. So uh, we call it put because in LSM trees, we do not really differentiate updates from inserts. So we do not really care whether the entry already exists, exists in the database and this, the new entry is an update or this is a completely new entry. We simply use the put API to make sure that we are writing the new entry to this memory buffer. And when the memory buffer is full, the entry will be sorted and flushed to the storage uh, eventually. But the put get API is very simple. Uh, we have to make sure that whenever we have a put, we never access older data before we access the newer data. And this is how this invariant that we call it in a sense, really allows us to make sure that a put operation, which is essentially a query operation, a point query, uh, will never return something that is invalid. So uh, this is how the put get API works. Apart from this, LSM trees also support range scans. So range scans are essentially range queries where you want to uh, fetch all entries between two given keys, let's say K1 and K2. And uh, in a leveled LSM tree, I'll talk more about what's leveling and what's trading in, the, in, in, in my talk um, uh, later on, but uh, the idea is that you have to really figure out all the sorted components that, that qualify for a range scan operation, a range query. And then, because there can be overlaps of the keys, there can be the same keys with duplicate different versions across several runs, you have to merge the content of all these qualifying sorted run, runs. And while you do the merge, you make sure that you are only retaining or returning the latest entry for every key. So this is how uh, LSM trees through the sort process of sort merging um, respond to range query. And finally, we talked a little bit about deletes. So deletes, as I mentioned, is also kind of a put operation, but instead of uh, pushing or putting uh, in a new, completely new entry, we do enter, uh, do put in a special kind of entry that we refer to as tombstone. A tombstone is nothing but it's still a key value pair. It has the key for the entry that you want to delete, but the value field is typically one byte long, which just says that this is a tombstone. So that's it. So the tombstone flag is what we call it. And this is what helps us differentiate a tombstone from a, a general key value entry. So the whole put, get, delete, range scan API in LSM trees are very simple in fact. Is, is, there, is there a way to have additional, I mean, I don't know what these would be. I mean, it's like the, the kind of the, one of the selling points of this data structure is that it's very simple, right? It's a simple API. But are there any other possible types of operations you can kind of define on an LSM tree that, um, that would be useful? Absolutely. So one of the, so um, as I talk about this put get API, uh, it's simple, it works, uh, but whenever it comes to complex operations like range queries, uh, LSMs do not perform as well as B plus trees do. Because if you think about a B plus tree, everything is sorted in the leaf. You can do, literally do a, a scan and be done with it. But LSM trees, mm -hmm. you will have to do a merge operation, which is quite expensive. It's a K-way merge that will happen in general. If you want to delete, for example, a range of values, which we uh, call range deletes, is super tricky in LSMs because uh, now you have to think about how you are going to delete uh, all the values because you do not really know how many valid entries are there within a given range. 
So uh, there are some work on range bleach in LSMs. We are also working on it in one of our projects. Uh, so the Pushgate API is very good when you have a very simple workload that has a bunch of point lookups and a bunch of inserts or updates. But when you have more complex workloads, uh, the API does not really allow us to do be more flexible. Rather, we have to write our own API, own uh, routines that can facilitate that. Cool. I mean, I guess like it's all about trade-offs, right? If there was, there's a trade-off you've got to make somewhere, right? So I guess you, 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 one of the benefits is having this really nice, simple data structure that's really good at, at ingestion and, and things like this. So, I mean, I guess this is, this is part of the trade-off, right? But anyway, cool. So let's talk more about rights then, because obviously this is kind of one of the big selling points of this data structure and probably one of the main um, determinants why it's become really popular. And um, with, like you said earlier on, the advent of big data, et cetera, et cetera. And we have these large volumes of data to deal with. So can you maybe give the listeners an overview of, of, of the recent research on how they, we've tried to improve ingestion performance in uh, log structure med based storage engines uh, over the past sort of, I don't know, five to 10 years? Absolutely, absolutely. And you correctly point out that uh, LSMs are designed to facilitate ingestion in a better way. Um, but that does not mean that we cannot make it better. So we have been trying, uh, putting in our in our, our hours to make LSMs even better for ingestion. So the uh, two primary things that come to my mind is uh, the implementation of the memory buffer. So um, I can give you an example, and it might help you understand why the implementation of memory buffer can even become a performance bottleneck. So if I have a bunch of inserts coming, I will simply append them to my buffer. And this is super fast. This is like literally big off one time you can you take to uh, perform this operation. But now you have a point query coming in. And as I mentioned, you will have to search the newer data first. So you have to look into the buffer if the entry is there. And because you simply appended, now your simple point query, in order to see the, whether the entry is there in the buffer or not, you will have to scan it. So you end up paying a big off N cost, where N is the number of entries in the buffer. And your whole workload suddenly slows down. What, what, what was constant time now becomes linear. But if you know that your workload does not have any Put operations all together, I would rather have a vector implementation where I will simply keep on appending uh, uh, my entries in the buffer. It will be super for ingestion. But now if I have a mixed workload that, where I know that there will be a bunch of inserts which are interleaved with a bunch of point queries, I have to rethink my design of the buffer. Uh, a skipply spaced buffer, for example, might be a better choice. I can even have a hash map based buffer. So uh, the implementation of the buffer, uh, in, we have seen in some of our experiments, depending on the workload, it can, it, there can be a difference of performance of about two orders of magnitude. The buffer size also really matters. So if you have a very small buffer size, it will be full sooner, you will be doing a lot of flush operations. So your workloads will see um, smaller stalls, but frequent stalls. A larger buffer size will hold a lot of entries, so which is good because some of the entries can be some point lookups may be served from the buffer itself. But at the same time, when you are moving all the entries in the buffer to the storage, uh, there will be a latency spike. So there, there is all these trade-offs that we talked about. Another thing that uh, uh, is huge in LSMs is how we are reorganizing or compacting the data on the storage. So. Uh, the buffer is really the smallest component of an LSM tree. Most of the data, like it typically 99% of the data in an LSM tree is storage resident. And it really, really matters how we are storing the data or writing the, the data on the device itself. So how frequently we are compacting data, whether we are compacting data eagerly or lazily, these design choices really affect the LSM performance. So classically, I briefly touched upon this before, there are two LSM designs. One is what we call a leveled LSM design, and the other is a tiered LSM design. In a leveled LSM design, every time you flush a buffer, you merge eagerly all the entries that you just flushed with all the entries that were there in the first level of the tree. And this way, you make sure that in every level of the tree, you always have only one sorted component. Having one sorted component per level is actually superb 
when it comes to uh, point query performance. I will talk about it later on a bit as well. Uh, but because you are merging every time you are performing a flush, the uh, ingestion performance is not super good. It is good, but it is not super good. On the other hand, uh, uh, other side of the extreme, you have the tiered LSM design. So every time you flush the buffer, you do not do any short merge. You just write the newly inserted buffer next to whatever was existing in the first level, and you are done. So this way, your ingestion performance does not require eager short merge, so you have a very good ingestion performance. But when you are performing a lookup, you will have to check all these sorted components within a, within a level. So tiered is great when it comes to ingestion, but when it comes to um, query performance, uh, leveling is more optimized. And LSM is a very flexible data structure. You can have a bunch of intermediate hybrid designs between the leveling and tiering extremes. You can have the first few levels implemented as tiered, the larger levels below the tree are leveled. So it really, uh, you can play around with the best design that you might want to have based on the workload that you have and the performance target that you are set. Yeah, you preempted my question there. I was going to say, is there any way we can sort of mix and match these two different designs and, and kind of explore the, the yeah. space between the two? But yeah, that, that's, that's brilliant. You can do that. On that, um, kind of, I guess going a, a level further with that is rather than making that, deci that, that decision of being, I'm going to kind of have this hybrid structure this way, is there what been research on that? Maybe we might, we might touch on this later on. I might be getting ahead of myself about adaptively changing the data structure and, and the balance between these two extremes of leveled and tiered based on the workload at runtime. Is that possible or does it have to be a, a static decision up front? Great, great, great question. So uh, this is what we have, we, have, we have been trying to do for the last five, 10 years, I guess, right? So uh, the idea is that uh, exactly what you mentioned. So if I know something about my workload, if my workload changes on the fly, can I switch from, let's say, in a very simple case, from a level LSM design to a tiered LSM design, because suddenly I do not have any point queries in my workload anymore. So I want to really facilitate ingestion faster. Uh, so the answer is yes and no. So we have been doing a lot of modeling and a lot of analysis about what design uh, would be optimized or optimal for a given workload. So we kind of have an idea about if I have certain knowledge about the workload, what would be my near optimal, let's say, uh, LSM tree design. So this part is, is good. And this part is the yes. The no part, uh, part comes from the fact that there is really no LSM design uh, in practice that can on the fly change the data layout. That is on the fly um, change a level LSM to a tiered LSM. And this is because the implementation uh, is tricky. So the transformation uh, of one LSM design to another really depends on how you are compacting data. And compaction until one of our works from two years back was literally a black box in LSM design space. So people knew that compactions go on. There are a bunch of compaction routines uh, that LSM trees have underneath, but no one really knew what are the different design choices that are there. So it was increasingly hard for people to understand how they can really change the compaction routine um, based on the workload and, and, and the kind of performance that they are looking at. So uh, this is essentially one of the uh, natural next step steps for us in the community. I'm sure in the next few years, we'll have a few endeavors that will, will attempt to do this. Uh, but to date, we still do not have an LSM engine that can transform on the fly. Cool. So we've been speaking about the, the, the right half of things um, so far. So let's switch back over to reads. So let's talk about the techniques and, the, and, and approaches we have for optimizing things like point, queries, range lookups, and LSM trees. It feels like we've, so far, we've kind of, we've done everything to make the right path a lot faster. How can we then go about and sort of kind of pulling that, lack of, lack that back a little bit and getting ourselves some good read performance as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, as you know, there is no free lunch, right? So if you have a super right uh, optimized data structure, you will take a hit when it comes to uh, reads. And LSMs are no exception. So if we do not have any auxiliary data structures, uh, that can help us for queries, uh, 
reads are quite expensive in elephant reads. So if you think about the point query, uh, I know that it might be in one of the LSM levels. So if I have one sorted run per level, which is the best design for reads, I still have to do a binary search, a binary search to see whether the entry is there in level one. If it is not in level one, it can be in level two. So once again, I do another binary search. So I end up doing L times big of N IOs, right? And IOs, as we know, are super expensive. So L is essentially the number of levels that I'm talking about, and N is the data size uh, that is on the storage. So, uh, so it will be super, super bad. So, and this is the most read optimized LSM variant we are talking about. For tiered LSM, depending on how many tiers we have in every level, it can be uh, even more expensive. Uh, so what's, how, how do state-of-the-art LSM engines work? Well, they trade uh, more memory to improve write, to in, improve reads, right? So what they do is that uh, because memory is cheap now, nowadays, uh, they have what we call offense pointers in memory. So offense pointers uh, retains the maximum of a maximum and minimum key for every storage page. So you really know whether or not you should be doing an IO if you have the fence pointers in memory. So this way you can really limit the number of IOs that you do for every level to one because you do not have to do an expensive binary search on the data on this disk anymore. You do the binary search on the fence pointers, which is in memory, and the fence pointer tells you which file may contain the entry, and then you go there. So yes, yeah, it is a huge win. We come down from L times log N to L. But again, if I have to do LIOs for one point lookup, it is still super expensive. So what we do is that we trade more memory to improve the performance further. So we I use this memory to have bloom filters for all the entries in the LSM tree. And now, before I probe a, a particular level, I consult the bloom filter, which is of course in memory, and it tells me with a very high probability if the entry is there or not. So this is how uh, we really cut down on the cost of point lookups. But again, nothing is free here. The cost that we pay is in terms of memory. Cool. So I just something that jumped out to me there while you were talking about that MB. Uh, we've, we've not really touched on um, hardware uh, so far, other than the fact that we've talked about kind of we can kind of improve things by giving ourselves some more memory and stuff. But has there been any research on um, exploiting sort of modern hardware with respect to LSM? Uh, trees and LSM and based storage engines like are there certain types of hardware that are more suitable for the characteristics of LSM trees? Great question again. So um, there have been several ongoing efforts that are trying to answer this exact particular question. So the LSM operating principle which is uh, out of place as I often refer to as uh, which is you do not really update things in place or delete things in place. It is uh, very similar to how modern SSDs work. So if you think about the SSD, uh, SSD operating principles, uh, you have small blocks called erase blocks in the device, and you can write to these erase blocks, but if you want to update something, you cannot really go in place and update it. So you have this garbage collection routine that has to kick off, but before that, you write the new entry, the updated entry in a different, uh, different erase block. And LSM trees are, are very much similar. So you have to update an entry. You do not go in place and change it. You just insert a new entry, which is somewhere uh, up top in the tree. So these two operating principles are very similar. And one of the key line of research that many groups and even we are focusing on at this point is that how we can take advantage of these devices uh, principles like garbage collection and writing in an out of place manner and make use of that in LSMs itself so that we can we, we reduce the overall write amplification of the system, that is the LSM running on SSD, because write amplification is caused at both players. Every time you do not make an in-place change, you are inducing write amplification. The device is doing it, the LSM tree is doing it. But can we combine these two and make something better? So one of the key lines of research is how we are trying to exploit the device's capabilities and make LSM-based storage engines uh, even better. 
Amazing. Some more interesting research that's going to happen there for Charlotte Ford to, to catch up and reading that yeah. when, when that when that comes out. Brilliant stuff. So, cool. So let's now talk about the performance trade-off between reads and writes. We've been treating them in somewhat in isolation so far. So how do I go about, I've got some workload and I don't know, it's got some proportion of reads, some proportion of writes. How do I go about picking the optimal design for my um, for, for my LSM tree, my LSM-based storage engine? What do I, how do I go about doing this? So like any data structure, LSM trees are bound by the RAM conjecture. So what is the RAM conjecture? Um, R-U-M stands for read, update, update, and memory respectively, right? So the idea is very simple. Uh, you cannot have it all. So you can try to improve uh, two of the three axes performance wise, and then you must take a hit on the third axis. And LSM trees are no exception. LSM trees are great on the U axis, which is update, which is right. Uh, but if you want to make them better for reads, that is the R axis, you must take a hit along the M axis, which is memory. And this is why I keep on mentioning, we do make reads better, but we pay a cost in terms of memory. But the good thing is that the whole LSM design is quite flexible. And between read optimized level design and write optimized tier design, LSM trees offer a wide range of hybrid designs, which I talked about, right? So in my work compassionately, I identified the four key design questions uh, that we always end up making within the compaction routine. And how we, depending on how we answer these design questions, we might end up with thousands or even 10,000 different LSM designs. So this goes on to show the rich design space that LSM trees offer. But at the same time, it also shows that it's a vast design space and it is very tricky to navigate when the design space is so vast. So the next step in my work, what we did is that we took an approach that was based on modeling and extensive experimentation. So we ended up running more than 2,000 experiments uh, by varying the workload composition, the workload distribution, the elephant tuning, and we tried to understand the impact of each of these four primitives, the four compaction primitives in isolation and when they are put in together. So this really helped us understand which primitives are, which design questions are more important uh, when I'm looking at certain performance metrics. So uh, this work we published in VLDB 2021, and it's, it's, it's a great experimental work that I'm very proud of. And this really goes on to um, give the researchers and uh, practitioners the idea about how we can navigate this rich yet complex LSM design space. So the goal is not always to come up with the best compaction algorithm or the best design, so to say, but rather with some, uh, some knowledge about the workload, we can definitely avoid the worst or worst designs. So we can definitely uh, choose something that is in the top 10 percentile performance wise. And this is uh, what we did in this work. Amazing. Yeah, you're just gonna say these are things you definitely don't want to do, and this stuff is probably gonna be good enough for you like 99% of the time, right? Like, yeah, just avoid these terrible you're things, and you're gonna be good, right? Yeah, yeah. That that's that's awesome. And we can link that work in the show notes as well, so the interested listener can go and can go and check check that out. So we, we we've took we've touched on various different like research possible research directions for LS uh, LS entries over the over the course of the um course of course of the podcast so maybe you could just summarize now kind of what's next on your research agenda for for lsms sure sure uh so elephants are still uh, elephants it's, it's still a green field so we have been doing um several lines of research here but um even if I talk about deletes, which was one of the starting points for me in LSM uh, research, how we can efficiently delete data from LSM trees, we have done uh, so many work on that, but still we have a very long way to go before we can build the LSM-based storage engine that is completely deletion compliant. So it, it, it's, it's still uh, significantly green. Um, one big problem that I kind of touched upon before is the right amplification in LSM tree uh, or any out of place data structures, so to speak. Uh, 
So if you are not going and make changes in place when you have updates or deletes, you are writing the same data over and over again with this expectation that eventually you will merge the uh, different versions of the data and retain only the latest one. But in this process, you are actually rewriting invalid data that was not supposed to be in the database in the first place. But because you did not delete them, you keep on writing them over and over again. And like any out of place data structures, skeleton trees suffer from write amplification. So in some, some of the research, uh, they show that LSM trees uh, end up exhibiting uh, 30x write amplification in practice. So for a particular design, if I'm ingesting one gigabyte of data in my databases, because of the database's internal operations, namely compactions, it uh, will move 30 gigabytes worth of data, which is huge, right? So this is one of the key problems that we uh, want to solve, solve as a community when it comes to uh, LSM-based storage um, engines. And of course, another thing that we briefly touched upon is the hardware software co-design front. So because the out-of-place data structure is common in the LSM design paradigm, as well as how the SSDs operate, uh, how can we avoid the multiplicative write amplification from the application that is the LSM and the device and piggyback both these garbage collection routines together to bring down the multiplicative cost factor to something additive. And this is this is this will be super important uh, in the future if we if we want to make LSM scalable uh, for the large amount of data that we have seen that we are seeing today. Fascinating. Loads of interesting directions there. And I guess there's enough there's enough work there to keep you occupied for a lifetime. <laughs> cool. So as kind of a software developer or as a data engineer, how can I leverage your findings about LSM trees in, in, in my day to day life? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. And um, I believe that uh, impactful research is uh, what helps the developers, the engineers, and the community as a whole uh, build better and more efficient systems. So um, understanding the elephant design space is the first step if I want as an engineer or as a developer to make my system uh, run faster or perform better, whatever the metric that I have at hand. And as I mentioned that we, in our work, we really break down all the black boxes that we have around the whole LSM design space. And breaking the black boxes allow us to think more fundamentally. It allows us, it, it exposes the fundamental design questions in front of us. And if we know how each of these fundamental questions, the answer to these questions affect the whole performance space, I am really one step closer to my goal of improving performance. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are still not there yet where I can give you the optimal compaction strategy or optimal LSM design, so to say, uh, given a workload or performance, but we can definitely identify the top K best designs given a workload and target performance. And this is, I believe, the first major step that we have uh, made along this line of lines of research. And uh, the whole idea is simple. If the develop, if we can help the developers or engineers uh, avoid the worst designs, we are already somewhat there. And everything else is, is the last 10 person that we have to improve on. Awesome stuff, awesome stuff. So, so while you've been working on LSMs, I mean, how, how long do you say, when, would you, when was your first um, sort of, uh, in, uh, uh, interaction with LSMs. You say it was around 10 years ago, did you say? Or have you been on this like five years? Less than five years ago. Less than five years ago. Okay, cool. So over that five-year period, what has been the, the most sort of like unexpected lesson that you've learned while working with them? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the key thing that I observed is that uh, when you're working with large-scale data, simple tasks can become extremely tricky. So... Uh, when I first heard about the problem of deleting data from LSM based storage engine, first of all, I did not know much about LSMs, uh, but my initial reaction was, uh, how can deleting data be? So you just go in there and delete data, why should I even care about uh, making it efficient or whatever? And then you start to understand more about how modern systems operate, more about the whole out-of-place update delete paradigm. 
more about the elephant paradigm and you start to think that yes it is it is not at all a, a difficult task if you do not have any uh, performance benchmark to meet you can literally find your data go there delete it everything is fine but this will be super super slow so the simple uh, operation like deleting data in an efficient way uh, when your database is super large can be super tricky and once you know that you you smile internally but you know that uh, uh, this is going to be quite a journey yeah nice that's that that's that's interesting speaking speaking about um about, about kind of journeys how I, I, from this of course it's like five year period as well like have there been numerous things that you've kind of tried that have failed like i guess I'd like to know more about the war stories of like, oh man, we went down this dead end for ages and this thing didn't work. And maybe the listener might be interested to, to kind of to know about. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I started working on this um, efficient data deletion project when I was in France. And uh, uh, that was more on the privacy policy level. We tried to understand what the regulatory requirements were, what, what we need as system designers to do in order to facilitate all these requirements. And then after I moved on to the US in Boston University, we really worked on the same project, but now instead of thinking of at a high level, we really went down into the systems and we tried to understand how the systems operate, how we can make delete efficient. And in, in the initial days, I remember traveling for Sigmod 2019. And before that, we had this idea about building deletion compliant data systems. We sent our drafts to so many people from academia for their feedback. And uh, after we got the feedback, we were very close, uh, really, really close to giving up on the project because people did not really care about deletes whatsoever. So people cared about ingestion, people cared about queries, deletes, not much. And uh, then again, we traveled to Sigmod. We were on the verge of giving up on the project. And we spoke uh, with a bunch of people from different uh, companies uh, who are from the industry. And for them, this was a huge, huge problem that they were facing at that point. So companies, because they were, for the regulatory requirement, companies were really struggling uh, to delete data in an efficient manner. manner. So, and uh, in, in during these discussions, we really found quite a few people who were very interested in the project. They, we, we did understand ourselves that this is indeed a problem that is worth pursuing. And the fast forward four or five years, we have done so much work on deletes. Uh, some of our work are actually, a version of it is running on production rocks DB. And this is something that makes me super proud, but the work has gained significant visibility. People do care about deletes now. And it all started uh, five years back, but it was, uh, not a very smooth journey. It was rather a bumpy one. Yeah, so like Sigma 2019 was like a sliding doors moment then where it's kind of, we've actually realized, this, I guess it's a prime example of like the disconnect sometimes that can happen between academia and industry and how, I mean, okay, now this, this thing, deletes are interesting, but then they're in the real, in the real world, this is a really big problem. Crazy. So, so when, you're, when you're not working on, a, on LSMs, um, what uh, other research are you, what other research kind of topics are yours? As LMs, as LM, are LSMs sort of the the kind of primary vehicle for your research at the moment? Or as the other things you dabble your, your toes in as well? It has been. It has been one of the primary uh, lines of research that I have been doing. I mean, in my previous life, I worked on wireless networks, cloud computing and edge computing and all the stuff, but I won't bore you with that. <laughs> uh, so apart from LSMs in the uh, data systems community, um, I have been working, one of the main projects that I have been working on is how we can index near sorted data. So to give you a very high level idea about what this project, what this project is about. Um, so if the data that I have is completely sorted, so I do not have to pay a lot of cost when I construct the index because the data is sorted. I might simply not build an index and do a binary search, which will be logarithmic uh, of n base two cost wise, or I can build a B plus three on the sorted data and this will be still logarithmic of n, but with, with the fan out of f, which is the fan out of the B plus three. So it will be significantly cheaper than the binary search. And uh, because my data was sorted to begin with, I did not have to pay any cost in sorting the data. 
On the other side of the extreme, if the data is completely scrambled and I have to insert it on top of my D plus two index, I will have to pay a, a remarkably high cost because n again logarithmic of n uh, because I have to insert every entry to the to my index data structure. So which is fine because this is the read write trade off that we always play around with. If my data is sorted, uh, then I do not pay any cost, which is understandable. But what happens if my data is nearly sorted, but not completely sorted? So if I forget about how modern systems work, and if I, if I am in an ideal world, if my data is almost sorted, I should pay almost no cost in sorting the data. So the indexed construction cost should be a function of how ordered or how sorted my data is. But if you look at any index data structure, B plus trees, B LS and trees, any index data structures for that example, uh, the cost of building the index is never a function of sortedness. There is a binary knob, sure, if the data is completely sorted, no cost in terms of uh, constructing the index, but anything that is not completely sorted, no matter whether it is nearly sorted or completely scrambled, the cost is always the same. So in this work, we try to build an index data structure indexing paradigm, so to say, that can exploit the sortedness as a resource. So when we, especially when we are, when we try to constitute uh, or construct indexes. So if my data is sorted or nearly sorted, I will pay, I will end up paying a proportionally low cost in ingestion uh, in constructing the indexes. So we published this work in, uh, I think this is where I met you first in CPCPC uh, in Sydney, last year and the full version of this work was published in ICD this year and and the whole idea is that using sortedness as a resource and pay end up paying less cost when the data is has some ordered or organization inherently amazing we could maybe do a podcast on that one there because that's another fascinating topic and how we can exploit that additional information to improve um improve um, index creation and, and things that's 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 fascinating um yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so, how, so this this kind of leads quite nicely into my into my next question, really. In that, how how do you go about sort of generating ideas? Like, what's your creative process? And then, how do you decide this is something that we want to work on for the next five years or however long? So, if you are jumping uh, domains from networks to databases, like I did, uh, the place to start is to talk to people. So, talk to people around you. Talk to people from industry. Talk to people from academia understand the practical problems that they are facing and try to uh, work on them. So this is a great starting point. It, ha it has been a great starting point for, from, uh, for me. And uh, then with experience, you get to see newer problems uh, as you work on the existing problems. So uh, this is how you branch off from one of your main projects that you are uh, working on. And um, I think selecting projects is always a, a tricky thing to do, but uh, in my head, ahead, uh, I do believe that there is no failure in research. So there are several projects that we end up investing some amount of time, maybe a lot of time in some cases, and we do not see the expected results that we um, that we began keeping in, uh, having them in my in our minds. But uh, essentially, there is no failure in research. So if you fail to achieve a target, essentially, you find different ways about how you should not approach a particular problem. And this is learning. And if you learn, there is really no failure. So there are, if, if it is definitive, then it is not research. So this, in, in other words, right? So um, there is always this risk, but with the experience, with your um, knowledge, you can always uh, make wiser decisions. But again, if I'm selecting a project that I'm really passionate about and it does not really work out, it's fine. It's just still learning. I absolutely love that perspective on it. That is a great way to think about it because I think so much, a lot of the time it's so easy to get hung up on, oh, I need to publish, 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 and it has to be the new cool sort of idea. And is that sort of all those kind of external pressures, but viewing it that way for me is like the, the way like science should be conducted, right? That's the, the very, it's very fundamental, right? If it fails, you've learned something, <laughs> right? Yeah, so no, that's, that's a really nice answer to that question. Cool. Um, so I've just just two more questions now. So um, the the, penult the penultimate one is um, quite a big picture. It's like, what do you think is the biggest challenge in database slash data management research today? 
Sure. So um, in my head, we are time traveling back to the 80s, right? So uh, we had data, but more importantly, we had very small devices. So it was very important for us to uh, think about ways how we can manage um, the small amount of data that we had, but with even smaller amount of compute or storage resources that we had available. So now fast forward 20, 45 years, uh, we have remarkably efficient storage and compute units, but the data has grown exponentially. So we have still the exact same problem. We have a lot of data and we have to think about every passing day, how we can manage efficiently this huge, huge amount of data that we have, how we can process data at large. Uh, and, and, and along those lines, it, it has become significantly important to understand uh, which data is useful, right? So we have a glut of data, but that does not mean that every piece of data object is equally uh, valuable. So we have to really find out ways how we can shed off data that are not really useful um, for our analysis. This way we can really reduce the load of managing and processing data. Another problem that we have is uh, protecting the privacy of data. And this is something that I have been working on for about five, seven years now. And the idea is that uh, there is no way for an, for an end user today to really be able to understand where the stream of his or her personal data uh, has flown. So who has their personal data and uh, contact tracing, uh, data tracing are some of the lines that people have been working on to find this out. But again, overall, uh, as I mentioned, simply deleting the user data on the user request in an efficient manner is a huge challenge. So because uh, I do believe fundamentally there is a trade-off between privacy protection and performance. So if you are really uh, willing to build a system that can offer all the privacy guarantees that you are looking at, then you have to take a hit on performance. So how we navigate this performance privacy trade-off is one of the uh, biggest challenge that we have today in the community. Uh, finally, I think what also comes to my mind is moving toward greener compute framework, right? So uh, with the, in the era of chat GPT and deep learning, the amount of data that we are processing every second is remarkable. So, and uh, with, with so much energy, so much resources being burned every single second, um, surely as the data grows, we have to think about greener compute framework. So um, I really want to invest a, a significant amount of my time in this particular line of research because uh, this is this, this is one scale, this is not sustainable. So we have to really move to something that is more sustainable. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the, um, the, all those dimensions there for sure, I mean, the privacy aspect of it, the energy efficiency aspect of it as well, and um, cool. Um, so yeah, so it's time for the, the last word now. So what's the one takeaway you would like the listener to, to take away from this podcast today? Sure. So I'll keep this one short. So, uh, <laughs> I think the key takeaway would be at the end of the day, uh, the performance of all these large data systems uh, that process, process uh, petabytes of data, it really boils down to the data structures and access methods that are used in the storage layer. And the key to improving performance and building efficient data systems is to really understand how the underlying data structures operate. And once you have a solid knowledge of that, you can really build a storage engine that serves your workload the best. So going back to the fundamentals, getting the basics correct, as we say in cricket, <laughs> Yeah, great. that's a great way to end it. So, fantastic. Thank you so much, Sivadeep, for coming on. It's been a fantastic to talk to you. If the listener is interested in knowing more about Sivadeep's work, we'll put a link to everything in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the show, please consider supporting the podcast through buying me a coffee. It really helps us cover all of our costs. And we'll see you all next time for some more awesome computer science research. <laughs>